millennial reign. And if anybody wants to go back on Facebook and watch it, or I'll put it on YouTube here real soon. But I try to do the best I can. There's literally like 180 scriptures about a thousand year reign in uh, the Bible. And I just tried to put some real blunt ones up this morning to not make it too long. Because we do try to keep everything within 30 minutes. Okay, and today we're going to be in Revelation chapter 21. Uh, this morning was millennial reign and uh, the great white throne judgment. Now we're getting into the new Jerusalem. And I saw a new heaven and new earth. I used to be kind of a smart aleck. People say, do you believe in Revelation, uh, the millennial, thousand year reign? I said, well, repeat after me, new heaven and new earth. I said, there you go. But actually, that new earth don't have nothing to do with thousand year reign. That's afterwards. <laughs> and uh, as we said, we're going to talk thousand year reign this morning. But, uh, you know, it, it's sad. The thousand year reign, you can't deny it if you read it. It says it six times, six verses. But I, I worked for a guy one time. He said, man, he said, my dad was a pastor. And he said, some guy at the church just said something about thousand year reign. So well, they grabbed him, threw him out of the church and everything. And he said, I told dad, I said, dad, it's in the Bible. He goes, I know, but we don't believe in that stuff. And I've heard people hated that. So, they've hated that so that doctrine so bad. And I don't know why. It's biblical. They just think everybody dies and gets a heart and flies around wings. And, and that's not the case. And if they read the Bible, they'll, they'll see that's not the case. But anyway, so I see new heaven and new earth. Where the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there's no more sea. Now listen, there's not going to be no big ocean. Like three quarters of the earth right now is covered in ocean. It ain't going to be that way when the new heaven and new earth comes down. There's, but there'll still be rivers. There'll still be lakes. There'll be small seas and stuff, but there won't be like the Atlantic, Pacific, and all that. It's gone. And as the new Jerusalem comes down, um, we kind of read the last chapter. I kind of, have you ever seen a helicopter land out in the field where it just blows stuff everywhere? That's kind of what's going to be happening as the new Jerusalem comes down. The, the earth is just going to change. And that's how we're going to get new heaven and new earth. And, uh, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Where's it coming from? Down, ain't it? Now, if we die right now, we go to heaven. We go to the Father's house. We go. You know, we're, we're, we'll be having up soul sleeping or not. But when this thing is finished, New Jerusalem, it comes down. And prepared as a what? Bride. Adorned for her husband. And I'm I'm still, uh, the bride of Christ is the city. I, I, I don't, I, I know everybody, and even I've said it, we're the bride of Christ, we're the bride of Christ. But as we read right here, the bride of Christ is the city. Now I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. So right now we don't have we we have access to the Father through the Son. But if we seen the Father right now in our bodies or whatever, man, it struck us dead in a heartbeat. And if God the Father got close to this earth in his his form he is now. Now we had the Holy Spirit and we had the Son come on earth. But have you ever held a dandelion before it turned into the, the it's just seeds? And you just hold it in front of me and talk and it just blows everywhere. The presence of God is so strong he could just speak and just you know everything change and blow us off the planet. But but here, the new earth, new heavens, new earth, God the Father is coming down to dwell with us. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give it to him that is a thirst, the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God he shall be my son. That's something to look forward to. That's what we're we're all living towards is this awesome day. You know, when we just and when we read last chapter where there was a great white throne judgment, that's not going to be a good day. It literally says God's gonna pull people out of hell and judge them before they go back into uh the lake of fire forever. And now why would he do that? Well, it's just letting them know why they're there, you know. And that's not going to be a day without tears. That's going to be a pretty rough day. That's going to be a, a day of a lot of... But after all that's done and it wipes the tears from my eyes, I, I personally don't believe 
they'll be able to look you down at, at hell and, and recognize anybody once you're in heaven. But on the day of judgment, you, you probably will. And, uh, and you know, it's, that's going to be a scary time, you know, for if you're not on the right side. But the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, and the whoremongers, and sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, all liars, shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And not one time does it say, but the fearful, unless they're saved. And the unbelieving, unless they're saved. And the bomb will, unless they're saved. It don't say that you fall. I'm telling you, you fall in iniquity, you're in danger zone. And any Christian that can just lie all the time and do all this stuff, they're, they're borderline reptobate. You, you, you've got to be careful. They, they're in a danger zone. I'm not going to be one of these preachers that's going to tell everybody you can sin or whatever you want to still make it heaven. I've heard that many times and it's wrong. The fruit of that just causes people to live their whole life. They don't live for God. They don't go to church. They don't pray. They don't do that one thing Christian, but they think because when they're seven-year-old, they uh, got saved and dunked in water. They live however. The Bible does not teach that anywhere. It's not even close to that. It says he who sins is of the devil. And... Uh, but if you fall in those categories, there's an altar up here. <laughs> you might want to repent. <coughs> and uh, the abominable, let me go through these real quick. The fearful, of course, those are just, I mean, when Antichrist gets in power, what's going to give him his power? It's going to be fear, people's fear. And cowardice just causes people to live under a system that God never intended for them to live. Then the unbelieving, of course, is just people who don't believe in God. The abominable, that's what we'll get into here in a second. The murderers, when that's just people, kills people. And whoremongers, that's, you know, the fornicators, teenagers. You all care if everybody in your school, everybody your age is going to sleep around. They're going to bust hell wide open. Do not fall into that, that trap, that culture that tells you that's the way to live. It's not the way to live. If you watch, if you watch it, your, the parents' age problems all comes from being a whoremonger, or not all the problems, most of them. Sorcerers, that is drug abusers. Ezra, just stay back there, sit down. I'm trying to find scissors. Yeah. Uh, the sorcerers are drug abusers. Now, if you got to have medicine, you got to have a medicine. But if you're an abuser, that's a different story. Drug abusers is, is people just want to sit around and get high all the time. And we see the fruit of that, don't we? People is lazy, they steal, they rob each other, they just... Uh, you know, it's just not a good lifestyle. It just brings you down. And a lot of people have a lot of potential to do great things in life, and they decide just to be a, a drug abuser. And that's not, that's not what God tends us to be. And drug dealers and everything. And, you know, our streets, our culture is just rich with just <laughs> drugs and drugs and drugs. And, and it's sad. It's pathetic. We're not supposed to live like it. We're supposed to be clean. We're supposed to be sober-minded. And idolaters, we don't see idolatry in America much. But let's say you go to India and everybody, where you go, people's got some kind of statue they're praying to. So it's still here. India is one of the biggest countries in the world. And ain't the only country that does idolatry. So idolaters and all liars, if you lie, some people, we, I, a lot of us know people that just lie like a dog. I had a friend one time, I swear you couldn't believe nothing. He, he'd tell you he went to Walmart, and you about guarantee he didn't go to Walmart. Then he'll tell you he had a Lamborghini in the car, in the basement or something. And sure enough, he would, you know. And you're like, Man, you tell the weirdest lies, you know. But that boy could tell truth, save his life. And some people just got that spirit where they lie, lie, lie. And you know where they end up? In the lake of fire. And that is the second death. The lake of fire is the second death. Okay, what's abominable? Okay, the abominable follows under these this category right here. These six things that the Lord hate. This is from Proverbs 6. Yea, seven are abomination to him. Now listen, not all not all sins are equal. I'm not going to teach that either. If you hit your thumb and say, make the blank out in the field and nobody hears it, that's not the same as living like this. And so these are sins that God hates. He says, a proud look. You ever seen people sitting around, man, they won't talk to nobody, they snub everybody, well, they think there's something. Um, and there are people like that, believe it or not. A lying tongue, people tell lies all the time. Hands that shed innocent blood, <clears throat> United States of America, government, <clears throat> you know, 
be careful on that, man. I tell you, we bomb people all the time. Don't have a thing to do with our freedom at all. And I respect soldiers. You got to have an army or your country's cooked. And I respect soldiers and everything. But I am not for it. And Christians need to be careful that we're not for going around bombing everybody because they don't have nothing to do. They're sitting there minding their own business. Look up, here's an American airplane. Boom. We'll pay for that. We'll pay for that because we fall under the, the United States of America citizens. And uh, uh, a heart that devises wicked imaginations. Tyler, you study that stuff like me. Is there people out there who just study wicked things and what wicked they can do to people all the time? Yes, they're out there all the time. Uh, feet that be swift to run into mischief. Uh, you know, as people that's always looking for trouble, something mean to get into it. They just get like a kind of like a high off of it. And I've heard thieves say. It's just that thrill of stealing something. You always want to keep stealing more and more and more, and you ain't getting satisfied unless you're stealing something. You know, just that 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 euphoria of, of getting stealing something, not getting caught, and then they eventually get caught and then they go to prison. So, um, a false witness, man, that's that. I couldn't tell you the people I know it's been slandered and their lives almost ruined over slander. And I got a friend who was help. He helped me. Um, in the wrestling business, man, the guy had it together. I'm not going to tell you details because I don't want anybody figuring out, but he helped me in the wrestling. Man, he, he was look, being looked at by big wrestling companies and everything, and uh, somebody smeared him, and he, every time he's around me, he's like, please don't believe it, please don't believe it. I said, man, look, I don't believe it. He said somebody lied on him, and he lost his job, lost his uh, wife. Every dime he gets goes to lawyers trying to get out of the trouble. He could have done a plea bargain, pled guilty, and, and he's like, I'm not doing that because I was innocent. And I've heard a lot of people fall under slander, so the slander is definitely a spirit strong today. And that's why I told everybody, man, you know, I've, I've always got people with me, cameras on me and everything. I'm not going to be lied about, you know. If I do something, I do something. If I don't, I'm not going to be put up and be lied about. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. And that's a real dangerous one. That one falls under all this other stuff. Uh, if you're constantly causing fighting among Christians and everything. Now listen, there's a balance. I don't like ministries uh, uplifting adulterers and, and drug addicts and everything. But I've got to be careful to warn people at the same time not to cause discord. People need to be warned about it cause discord. If I know something's going on in another church, you gotta be careful, you know. You don't want to cause discord, but sometimes people need to be warm. Sometimes, you know, you, sometimes it's best to mind your own business. But uh, a, pre a preacher's job is to call out sin, and you're definitely allowed to call out sin. That's part of what we do. Anyway, just somebody just causing trouble all the time, just going around, just nose in, stick their nose in everybody's business. I know everybody knows somebody like it. it sticks their nose in everybody's business and just causes gossip, just causes discord, just tries to tear everything up. Okay, they come into me, one of the seven angels, which have been the seven vials for the seven last plagues, and talk to me, saying, come hither, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Guess what he shows them? The city, not us. And he carried me away in the spirit in a high mountain and showed me that great city. The holy Jerusalem, ascending out of heaven from God. So that's the bride. You know, you can get your stones recorded, look up bride, and see everywhere where it says bride. Hey, Adriana, please move up. And uh, thank you. And the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven of God, having the glory of God in her light, was like unto a stone most precious, even as a jasper stone. Anybody know what jasper looks like? I don't really know. Either. I got a chart up here because I'm like, man, I, it's going to take me a month to pull up all these stones, show everybody what they look like. Even as a jasper stone, clear as crystal, so I'm imagining, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and the gates and the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of. Israel. So there's 12 gates in the city, um, in this great city. Now we're going to read here in a minute where the city's 1,500 square miles. It's got a real tall, but the gates are never closed. I used to hear preachers say all the time, what do you think heaven's got gate for? It's to keep people out. I'm like, they're never closed. <laughs> the door's open. You know, it's got angels at them and everything. So, uh, and on the east three gates 
on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. On the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the name of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Okay, I don't believe Judas will be one of those. Who replaced Judas? There was a guy in Acts, Matthew, Matthias, and then there's Apostle Paul. I think one of them two. You don't really read, read much about the, the Matthias, but you read a lot about Paul. I kind of have a feeling that that guy, since he wrote like 13 books in the New Testament, kind of have a feeling that guy's going to be the uh, the name on the foundations here. I don't. I, I know sure Judas ain't. If it's Matthias, it's fine. I mean, he took his place. He, he got the straw or whatever. And uh, and he talked with me and had to go to read to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lie four square as a length as large as the breadth. And measure the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and breadth and the height were equal. And uh, 12,000 furlongs is 1,500 miles. So you know we read about Babylon being that great city. I'm like, man, I just have a hard time thinking it's like New York or Hong Kong or something. I just think it's a, either a country or a system or whatever. Well, when I seen this, that the New Jerusalem is called a city and it's 1,500 miles long, why, you know, square and everything, like each wall is long, I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> you know, it's, I can see a country being called a city. Okay, and he measured the wall thereof 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. And uh, the 144 cubits is around 300 feet. Now, I believe it's worded kind of funny, code scriptures back. Some people believe the wall is 1,500 miles tall uh, because it says the, the height, breadth, width, and everything. I, I believe that it's 300 foot tall. It's like, a, it, if it's not 300 foot tall, it's 300 foot wide. And I don't know why God, I mean, you know, God do whatever he want to, but I would imagine more that it's 300 feet. That's like a 30 story building. You might been in New York or anything like that. I don't know if Knoxville's got any 30 story buildings or not. But if you've been in New York or been in big cities, they had a lot of 30 something, you know, a lot. And that's pretty cool. You can imagine driving up to a city and seeing a 30, 300 foot tall wall. That's pretty cool, isn't it? You know. And if it ain't tall, it's wide, 300 uh, feet wide. And that's, you know, it's like quite a football field wide. And the building of the wall of it was jasper. And the city was pure gold, like into clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manners of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald. Okay, that's a, kind of a chart there of the emerald's green, the chalcedony is like a purple, jasper's red, sapphire's blue, sardonyx like a, a crimson color, topaz is blue and gold, beryl is green, chrysophorus is green, that's like a dinosaur, Jack, jacinth is like orange, just sardis is orange, grass, salty is green, amphithus is, is uh, purple. Now, you know the ephod that the priest wore in the Old Testament that had 12 stones on it? You know, those are the birth stones, the 12 birth stones. Yep. And, and like, I can't remember what my birth stone is, but it's like a maroon color. That was one of the stones on the ephod. I looked it up one day and said, man, that's the, that is the, 12 birthstones. And I looked it up in the crowd. I said, it is. It's 12 birthstones. So 12 birthstones come from the Bible. That's pretty cool. Okay. And the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrasus, the eleventh, the jacinth, the twelfth, and the amethyst. Anybody know construction? Imagine how much that would cost. <laughs> you know, uh, um, somebody alerted me and told me, said, Pay attention to the technology they had back in the older times. Horse and buggy. You can look up pictures. Now, photography's been around for almost 200 years, really. I mean, I think like 1820-something was when the first picture was taken. So by the 1850s, pictures were good. During the Civil War time, pictures were great. You can look at their buildings, how beautiful they were, how articulate they were, how the architecture was just mind-blowing. 
And they were horse and buggy. Like, how in the world did they do that? But you get even older pictures, like paintings and everything from like 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, even older than that. And you look behind them at the buildings, you're like, oh my goodness, man. You know, look like Dracula's castle, Vlad and Player's castle over there in Europe. The thing is unreal. I mean, it would cost a billion dollars to make it today's time. It's just they really knew how to make stuff, you know. And now, when you see a new building built, it's just a block, cheap block, that the big bad wolf come blow it down if you don't watch it. Because the building materials are getting expensive. They're not getting, maybe not as expensive, but the quality is going down really bad. But just imagine the value of all this. I mean, man has to get stones like this where you have to mine the earth and spend a fortune and, and just work ourselves to death, just get it by heaven is just going to have it be built out of it. It's going to be beautiful, too. It's going to be amazing. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Now, everybody knows how valuable real pearls are and how you have to go in the ocean, get clams or whatever, the, the oysters, and hunt for the uh, pearls. But this is how, you know, the gates are built out of pearls. And you can imagine how beautiful that would be. Every several gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold. As it were, transparent glass, you know, just gorgeous. And uh, before, like Hollywood, movies, and TV, and internet stuff, people reading this, they're like, wow, they never, everything they seen was like the same color all the time. Like if you go out in nature, everything's about the same color. And then you see something blue, you're like, whoa, blue, because nature don't form blue much. If you got an animal with blue on it, it's rare. I had a rooster that had blue on it, and that's, that was rare to get blue in nature. Animals don't have blue on them much. So there's some like bluebirds and stuff. But to see all these colors and all these fine jewels and see all this stuff, man, it's, uh, it's going to be mind-blowing, you know. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So, uh, yeah, we're not going, you know, the Old Testament stuff, they had to go to temples, New Testament temples, and we go to church and everything, but their God is which is going to be there. And we don't have to go to church to worship God because he's going to be there. <laughs> you know, we're just, you know, he's going to be there to worship all the time. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light of her. So we're not going to have days or nights. It's just going to be lit up all the time. And that's kind of cool, too, you know. And, uh, you know, we, we, I like the nighttime, but I don't be out in the woods in the nighttime. I like the night times, but I, I don't like going outside, walking too much. I don't know what's behind me. It's kind of scary, you know. I don't know how to laugh at me. People watch scary movies to get scared on purpose. And then they have to go out to the woods or something. They're about to have a heart attack, you know, walking out there. Um, well, we went looking for my friend that got lost in the woods. It scared me to death. I walked up on a skunk. It was got to get dark. I'm like, man, Bigfoot's liable to come out here and something. That scared me to death. But there ain't going to be no more darkness there. And, and just think about it. It's daylight all the time. And it's going to be nice. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor to it. Now pay attention to this. This is when, this is, the thousand year reign's done. Okay, New Jerusalem's come down. They have a 1,500 mile square city with gates. They're open. And there's angels. And then it says the nations, the kings of the earth, will bring their glory and honor to them. So it seems like there's still going to be nations. And there's still going to be stuff going on. And we're still all going to be bringing the nations will be bringing. Now, are we going to be? Is it going to be humans, or is it just going to be pure saints? Of course, the saints will be in the city and everything. Uh, but I don't know. It's just something to think about. You know, I ain't trying to start no weird doctrine. I'm just saying, pay attention because it does say the kings of earth to bring their glory and honor to it. So, you know, a lot of people don't even believe. It's mind blowing that there's a thousand year reign of Christ where He comes back and we rule over. The saints rule over humans were priests and, and, and ruler. That just blows people's mind. But it's, that's, man, I tell you, if you don't believe in it, it's like this much Bible you got to take out because it's 180 verses in the Bible talking about the thousand year reign. The Old Testament makes absolutely no sense if you don't believe in the thousand year reign. And God told the children of Israel, you're going to get Israel, you're going to get the land of Israel. And the real children of Israel, the Old Testament, never got it. But they'll get it in the thousand year reign. 
And the gates of it shall not be shut all day by day. For there shall be no night there. They, they might have heard preachers preach. What do you think it has gates for? Keep people out. This says it ain't going to be shut though. <laughs> you know what it is? I'm like, gosh, man, read that. If you're going to preach on the gates all the time, read like the only few scriptures it talks about it. It says it ain't going to be shut. And that shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. So again, it says the nations is going to bring glory and honor to it. So, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, it's, this, this, this chapter is just, it is what it is. You can't really, I'm not going to be one of these guys trying to make money and say, oh, that's, that's Russia. <laughs> you know, that's Muslims. Man, the worst one that kills me the most is saying the scorpions in Revelation. They come out, the locusts, that sting like scorpions or whatever, saying that's Muslims. That just drives me up the wall. That's the craziest, nuttiest interpretation of a scripture I've ever seen in my life. And you know, now I've heard, studying Revelations, I haven't been able to, I, I listen to so many preachers and teachers, but as far as Revelation goes, I have not been able to get no help these guys. They are lost. They are confused. They are into I don't know what in the world they're thinking. And, and they might, that's why people don't read Revelation. Everybody's got them confused to death. And and uh, they don't believe in nothing. But people tell them not to believe in it. You know, there's people I know this town's mad at me for teaching a thousand year reign. But why don't you believe it? Because somebody told you not to believe in it. You got your own Bible like I do. And that's why we have this big TV. A lot of churches wouldn't like that. So it can show you to your face what the Bible says. And you're not taking my word on it. You're reading it for yourself. And I, I'm not braggart or nothing, but Revelation makes sense. It makes a lot more sense since we've been going through this series. And you just got to remember, first three chapters, 12 tribes of, uh, I mean, it's talking about the seven churches of Asia. And then we start talking about the, the, the seals being loosed on the earth and all that, the, the four horsemen and all that. And then the tribulation, and then we're raptured out of here and there comes the wrath. And then it's, you know, we had the 140,000 and we had two witnesses and all that. And then it starts all over at 12. It, that's the big key to understanding Revelation. That, that does, it is kind of hard to understand until you know, understand that it kind of starts all over at chapter 12. And then it parallels the first half. And, uh, and then we, we get back in like chapter 13, tells us about the mark of the beast, Antichrist, and we get back in tribulation. And then we have the rapture, and then we have the wrath for that. And... Uh, the vials and the trumpets are real close. And then we have the armies come. Uh, the Euphrates dries up. The kings from the east come. The, the Armageddon. All Jesus has to do, he comes back and says on a white horse, white horse army, he speaks, they're dead. That's all he do, he speaks. And then uh, we start the thousand year reign. At the end of it, God can make God. And then God the Father sends fire from heaven and kills them. So they're wasting their time fighting. And then we have the Great White Throne Judgment and the New Jerusalem comes down. That's where we're at right now. And, and that's simple. That's easy to understand. And I can't tell you who the seven horns are going to be because that would be a... I could guess, but it wouldn't be, probably wouldn't be a good guess. We won't know until it gets here. I can't tell you exactly what the mark of the beast will be, but it says it's the end, the right hand, and the forehead. Whatever goes in the right hand, and the forehead, I don't want nothing to do with. <laughs> I don't want nothing in my right hand, and in my forehead. Now we have technology... To put stuff in your right hand in for it. They say you can't buy or sell without it. Uh, we have technology now. My uh, debit card has a microchip in it. And you can't. I can't use it with that that chip. I can slide it. It won't take it. I have to put the chip. Man, it's all leading closer. And uh, I mean, to me, it's right here. I, everything going on right now is forerunner to Revelation coming, and that's that's why I'm glad that God's led us to the teach this and go through this so it makes more sense and they shall bring the glory and honor of nations to it and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth well what if, what if somebody is a drug dealer or drunkard whoremonger but they've saved when they're seven year old are they still going it says not anything's entered that defileth or what's their work of abomination we went over to the abomination or make it for lie but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Everybody's got to make sure your name is there. And it stays there. And I spoke briefly this morning. If you want something bad enough, you've got to make decisions leading toward that. 
I want to see people here healed. I want to see people in this area better. I have to start making decisions on the actions I take is leading up to that, to my prayers being stronger, to my lifestyle being closer to God, to me crying out to God, my prayers are being answered. So I got to cut out a lot of goofy stuff. I got to cut, cut out uh, a lot of time wasting and idle talk and all that. I've got to cut out food. <laughs> you know, I got to cut out, uh, I got to put more time in the word. I got to put more time in praying. I, if I want to see things happen, I have to make decisions in my life to lead to that. And I, I used to, uh, when I was in the wrestling business, my trainer was the head trainer of WWE. He trained The Rock. He trained the Vince McMahon to wrestle. He trained all the big Kurt Angle. He even, even made Stone Cold Steve Austin get trained again through, my, through the guy that trained me. And he, said, he told guys, he said, if you want to make it, you can. But you've got every decision you make in your life has to be leading to that. You make it. And he's like, man, you won't lay in the bed all day and not get up and work out. You're not going to make it. If you don't want to, you know, I'm talking about wrestling. If you're not going to get good gear, you're not going to make it. If you're not going to learn to wrestle, you're not going to make it. He said, you have to, all the decisions you make has to leave you. And that's everything. If you want to be, if you just a job or career you want, you have to pay the price to get there. You have to make decisions. Tyler's an engineer. Guess what? He wouldn't be there unless he went to college for five years. So that's a decision he had to make if he wanted to be an engineer. And even in my life, I wanted to make it in business. I tried it, stuff failed. I tried stuff failed. Tried stuff failed. Tried stuff failed. But guess what? It got led to. I get to where I've got to work at home for six years. I ain't had to get up, go clock, clock in, clock out, be screamed at by a boss, or be screamed at by coworkers. That happened more than getting screamed at by bosses. I got screamed at by coworkers all the time. And that was because the decisions I made led to me wanting to be in business. So if you want to be close to God, you're going to have to make decisions. You're going to have to come to church, read the Bible more, fast more, pray more, cut out a bunch of junk. If you have a problem with cussing, you're probably watching TV shows with cussing in it. That was my problem. I'd hit my toe and the bad word would come out almost, I couldn't control it, it seemed like. And I was praying to God, I just don't want cuss. Cut out them TV shows you're watching. I said, well, God, they beep it out. You know what they're saying. You ain't stupid. They're like, oh. So I cut out. And you know what happened? Now I hit my toe and go, ow, instead of bite the bank. And, you know, you, you've got to make decisions leading. And, and, and I'm telling you, put God first. And the rest of the stuff will follow. I, I mean, I started serving God first. That's why it ended up helping me to be doing the eBay and stuff full time, is putting God first. Because that's what God called me to do. He put business inside of me and interest inside of me. So, okay. Uh, next Sunday morning, you turn me off. Somebody. Next Sunday morning, we'll finish that. Sunday morning, Revelation 22. Like I said, I, I appreciate y'all bearing with me the Revelations. It's really helped me. I, I read Revelations at least once a week anyway. Usually I'd read it every morning before I come to church. That's why I seem kind of repented, preaching still, same stuff I used to because I read Revelations.